I'm Stephen Toop, and as Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, it's my great honor to welcome you to the inaugural Dr. Yusuf Hamid Frontiers in Chemistry event. Last year, unable to hold our annual Royal Society dinner, we reimagined the occasion through the magic of modern technology. And many of you were there when we enjoyed a fascinating presentation from Professor Sir Shankar Balasubramanian. Since then, Yusuf Hamid and his wife Farida have given generously so that we can hold such events more regularly. This is an intimate meeting where you can see and speak with one another. It isn't the same thing as being together in a room, but as you're calling in from all around the country and even further afield, it is truly wonderful to be together in this way. While it's my profound hope that soon I'll be able to welcome all of you back to Cambridge, I'm delighted that we can at least meet like this. There will be further evenings such as this one, but we will also present webinars to a wider audience using this platform to deliver insights into our research and teaching. Cambridge scientists have been making world-changing discoveries for centuries, and the Yusuf Hamid Frontiers in Chemistry series will ensure that the world knows about the most recent. The man who's made this possible really needs no introduction here. An alumnus of Christ College, Yusuf Hamid has spent his career not only developing drugs vital to tackling the world's most challenging diseases, but crucially, ensuring that those who have need of those drugs have access to them. His company, CIPLA, has made drugs to treat HIV AIDS, tuberculosis, asthma, and many more diseases affordable across the poorest nations of the earth. He's always been profoundly generous to Cambridge and last year made a leadership gift to the Department of Chemistry, enabling us to attract and support the world's brightest academic talent in the discipline. This includes exceptional early career researchers and outstanding doctoral students through the Hamid Scholars Program. His generosity ensures that the Yusuf Hamid Department of Chemistry will remain forever at the international pinnacle of teaching and research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yusuf Hamid. Over to you, Yusuf. Respected Vice Chancellor, many thanks for your kind words and the sentiments expressed. The Department of Chemistry in Cambridge, as you said earlier, is one of the world's great knowledge centers, producing innovative science and scientists of the very highest caliber. And as you said, this group is planning to change the world, has already changed the world, and planning to change the world. We are here delighted that this regular event will help to keep chemistry at the scientific forefront and keep Cambridge abreast with the rest of the world. And today's talk is the first in a series by the Department of Chemistry for Distinguished and Leading Scientists. We have today uh, Professor John Pyle, a close, intimate friend of ours, whom we've known for many, many years. And he will talk to us on the contribution of uh, green chemistry and et cetera. And we look forward to hearing him. My stay in Cambridge over six years was in the mid 1960s, 50s. And over the past 60 years, I've appreciated more than anything else, my years in Cambridge. I sincerely believe that I'm now an integral part of Cambridge. I will always be indebted to this great institution and for what it stands for. In my own humble way, I'm contributing towards the benefit of future generations, primarily in the area of advancement in chemistry and hope that this webinar series continues for a long, long time yet to come. Vice Chancellor, the floor is yours. 
Thank you so much, Yusuf. And I can assure you that uh, we feel that you are very much a part of Cambridge and indeed very much a part of Christ College. I know that. I see that the master is with us. And uh, yeah. uh, that's wonderful uh, to have your, your warm words as always. And thank you once again for your generous gift, inspiring the renaming of the chemistry department and enabling, among so many things, this event. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce John Pyle, Professor of Atmospheric Chemistry and recognized nationally and internationally as a true leader in his field. Chief Scientist of the National Center for Atmospheric Science and a member of the NERC Council, he played an instrumental role in the Montreal Protocol process, which led to internationally agreed limits on ozone depleting substances. He's currently co-chair of the scientific assessment panel for the Montreal Protocol. Through numerical modeling of the atmosphere and interpretation of atmospheric measurements, he's changed our understanding of the chemistry of the stratosphere and the troposphere. Please welcome Professor John Pyle. Vice Chancellor, thank you very much for those, uh, for those very kind words. Um, Vice Chancellor Farida Youssef, alumni of the department of, of the university, friends of the department. Um, it is a huge honor for me to give this inaugural, inaugural talk in the Frontiers of Chemistry series named in honor of Yusuf. One of the pleasures of being head of department, I was head of department before uh, James Keeler, who, who's with us today. One of the pleasures of being head of department, and there were many actually, um, was getting to know Farida and Yusuf really well. Um, they're wonderful people, um, and I'm delighted that the, uh, their, their, their contact, uh, their, their involvement in Cambridge is going from strength to strength. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. So my talk is called Zero Carbon Chemistry. And I have to confess, first of all, and I hope nobody's gonna be disappointed with this, um, that the title is somewhat tongue in cheek. Uh, my background is uh, as an undergraduate in physics and organic chemistry is something of a closed book to me. Um, I've done work on methane, I've even done work on isoprene, five carbons, uh, but I'm afraid uh, my knowledge of, 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 of carbon chemistry doesn't go much beyond that. But of course zero carbon uh, is used as a shorthand for the challenge that we face in addressing climate change. And what my talk today is going to try to do is to say something about the work that we're doing in the department related both to climate change and the related problem of air quality. Atmospheric chemistry, uh, I'm an atmospheric chemist as, as you've heard from, from the vice chancellor. Atmospheric chemistry is different from a lot of the chemistry that goes on in the building because of the spatial scales that we're interested in. My colleagues uh, will very often be interested in uh, the, the um, properties of materials. They might well be interested in, in what's going on at the molecular and submolecular scale. Those things are of course absolutely crucial and they're crucial in atmospheric chemistry. But in atmospheric chemistry, we're also interested in the fact that we can emit pollutants in the middle latitudes of the Northern hemisphere and they can have an impact uh, in high, uh, the high atmosphere of the Southern Hemisphere. So the spatial scale that we're dealing with in atmospheric chemistry is very large. One of the consequences of that is that we, not only do we have to make fundamental measurements in the laboratory, not only do we have to support those fundamental uh, measurements with theory, but we have to make measurements in the atmosphere. And it's that triumvirate of, 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 of approaches uh, that I'm going to say something very, very briefly about. What I'm going to try to do, just to make, make, it, make it clear to you, I'm going to try to give you a very simple flavor of the work that I'm doing, but also that my colleagues in atmospheric chemistry in the department are doing. So I won't go into anything in too great a depth. It will be a little bit superficial. I'll be jumping from topic to topic, but I hope I will convince you that this is really uh, exciting science and it's really uh, relevant science. Before I say anything about, uh, about what we're doing, it's appropriate to acknowledge our antecedents in the department. 
And, and here I have a picture on the, um, on the left of uh, Norwich uh, with, with Princess Margaret. I suspect Yusuf might well have been in the building on this day when the, when the department was opened. And Norwich and Porter over here um, got the Nobel Prize for their work on uh, fast, fast reactions, uh, understanding by fast flash photolysis uh, the rate at which uh, radical species react with, reacted, react with one another. And that, those, that uh, methodology was crucial to developing um, kinetic data for use in the atmosphere. We have a lot of radical species which play uh, really important roles, very fast chemistry. Um, and the chemistry that we have is building on this pioneering work of Norrish and, and Porter. Brian Thrush worked with Norrish. Brian is in the middle here. He was head of department when I joined. And he, unlike the other two, probably would have called himself at least partly an atmospheric chemist. He was a uh, kineticist, a spectroscopist, uh, but a lot of his work was absolutely uh, tied to understanding uh, the, the changes in, in, in the atmosphere. So a huge thanks to, 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 those, to those colleagues and a huge, huge thanks from me to Brian uh, who brought me to, to Cambridge. I wanted to show this next slide and it's quite complicated. I'll spend a little bit of time on it. It's from the IPCC, which is the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. So it's not my work. It, it, it uses the work of a huge number of people. And what we're looking at is the radiative forcing caused by different gases. Now, radiative forcing is simply a measure of the impact of a particular gas on climate, a particular, uh, usually a greenhouse gas on climate. And it's measured from the present day backwards, beginning in, in the pre-industrial era. The numbers down here in watts per meter squared, and, and as a rule of thumb, if you divide two watts per meter squared, or, or if you do, divide the number in watts per meter squared by two, it's a rough indication of what we think is the impact on surface temperature due to this forcing. So the total accumulative um, radiative forcing from all of these things up here, I'll explain them in a second, is a little bit over two watts per meter squared. And we think that since the pre-industrial era, uh, global surface temperature has changed by about one degree. So carbon dioxide is the gas with the largest signal. This is the largest forcer of, of climate change, but it's not the only one. And what I'm trying to do with this slide is to persuade you that atmospheric chemistry is crucial. So the next gas down, these four gases here are all relatively long lived gases in the atmosphere. Methane, um, the, the net methane signal is something like two thirds of the signal of CO2. So we have to know about, uh, about methane. What's more, the contribution of methane, this orangey yellow bit, is the direct radiative impact of methane that's been put into the atmosphere. But methane in the atmosphere reacts. And one of the things that happens when methane reacts, certainly in the presence of the oxides of nitrogen, is that it produces ozone. And ozone is another greenhouse gas. So there is a, a contribution because we've put methane into the atmosphere from ozone to radiative forcing. And similarly, the blue thing here is that when methane is oxidized, ultimately it produces water vapor. And that's the signal we're seeing there. The halocarbons are, are similar. The halocarbons are the gases that, as the Vice Chancellor has already told us, have been regulated by the Montreal Protocol. They are ozone destroying gases, but it turns out that they were also very potent greenhouse gases. And uh, this is their radiative forcing. Well, you might say it's not very large, it's, it's significant. The point, however, is that this radiative forcing from CO2 is since the pre-industrial era. So we're going back 200 years. All of this from the CFCs has happened in the last um, about 50 years. So this is a really important perturbation. I often say to my students, again, slightly tongue in cheek, that it's a good job these gases did destroy ozone because if, we, if they hadn't, they would not have been regulated under the protocol and their radiative forcing would have been you know, very much more significant as we'll, as we'll see later on. These gases do destroy ozone. Ozone's a greenhouse gas. And you can see a little bit of negative forcing there. So this is cooling of the atmosphere. Down here, we've got a number of other gases, carbon monoxide, non-methane, volatile organic compounds, NOx, 
the oxides of nitrogen. And these gases are not uh, infrared active. They're not greenhouse gases, or some of these might well be. Uh, but the, but the, their radiative impact, their direct radiative impact is not terribly important. But their, their subsequent oxidation in the atmosphere to produce, for example, carbon dioxide or methane or ozone uh, do contribute, does contribute to radiative forcing. So again, we absolutely have to understand the chemistry of these gases if we're going to understand their radiative forcing and their contribution to the warming of the surface. Finally, aerosols and, and precursors of aerosols are emitted into the atmosphere. These are, if you like, droplets, uh, condensables that, that form droplets in the atmosphere. Uh, they're very important both directly, but with rather uncertain uh, sign. And uh, they're, they're indirectly important because aerosols can affect cloud properties and clouds are an important part of the climate system. And I'll say again, something more about this at the end. But the, the bottom line of this, the real message from this slide is to say that although carbon dioxide is really important, there are lots of other contributors to global warming that we need to understand and whose chemistry we need to understand if we're really going to get a proper grip on this problem. The approach that we've taken in the department that my group and, and and, and my colleague Alex Archibald have taken is to use numerical modeling. And what this shows is a, a snapshot um, from a numerical model. Uh, it's basically the Met Office's weather and, and climate model into which we have led the implementation of atmospheric chemistry. We are, we are highlighting a region of the, the North Atlantic. Uh, we're looking at a period during the summer of 2003 when some of you will remember there were very high temperatures at that stage, record high temperatures in, um, in the UK. Um, and a large number of people, more than 40,000 it's believed, died in Northern France and, um, and the UK, partly from heat stress, uh, partly because of the, of the air pollution. And what we're looking at here, uh, the, the red pulses are high amounts of ozone. There's a, an ozone scale here from the very warm colors being high, the very low colors being blue. What you can also see is that there is pollution over here in North America, and that pollution gets advected across uh, the Atlantic. We're not seeing particularly strong advection in that stage, but it's a weather system. Here we are, here's a bit of pollution that's coming out and it's being, uh, the pollution changes as it's moved along, but it's basically blown over uh, to Europe. And similarly, pollution from, from uh, um, the UK, uh, the, the pollution from, from Europe, will be advected eastwards over, over to Asia. So this is a, a, a primary tool that we use. What we, what we like to use these models for is to understand how the atmosphere works. We're, we're scientists, we're driven by wanting to know exactly how the atmosphere works. And this is a great tool for doing that. But of course, you can also use numerical modeling. You can use numerical models to guide uh, to guide policy. And this is uh, some work that my colleague uh, Alex Archibald uh, was, was involved in. It was a big UK collaboration with scientists in India. And what we're looking at here is, um, first of all, observations in Delhi of ozone over a 24 hour period. And, and pollution was very high in this situation, um, up to a, nearly 100 parts per, per billion probably more than twice the eight hour um, uh, uh, concentration um, that, that, that organizations like the, Euro, the, the um, EPA in America would say is, is healthy. So this is really unhealthy amounts of ozone. We see here a numerical model calculation. It's not quite the same model that I showed you before, uh, which actually reproduces that data quite well. And the question is, what can you do uh, about this? How would you bring uh, ozone levels down in, in a city like Delhi? Production depends on emissions of the oxides of nitrogen, you know, combustion in the internal combustion engine, and these volatile organics, again, partly from, uh, from, from petrol and diesel, but, but other sources as well. And over here, what we see is a, uh, it, it's a, a, a we, we sampled 
the model space to look at how uh, ozone changes with the emissions of the oxides of nitrogen and with the emissions of these volatile organic compounds. And we think Delhi sits about there where the star is. I guess if I'd asked many of you, how would you bring ozone down um, in a particular city? You'd say, well, I'll, you know, we need to stop motor cars emitting oxides of nitrogen. If you, if you reduce NOx in Delhi, then you're going to come down this line here where I'm moving my pointer. You're going to move to higher amounts of ozone, these warm colors. So actually the policy in Delhi would be to remove the VOCs and move this way before you start moving down that way. The point I'm trying to make is that these models can be used for policy. And certainly one policy does not fit all. If you're going to do policy, you have to have the very best science to inform it. I think that's the bottom line of this particular slide. I said something earlier on about, um, uh, about measurements, about the, uh, the, the absolutely essential role that measurements play. And this is a picture taken, this is from 25 years ago, I guess, um, when I was up in, in, in northern, um, northern Sweden, inside the Arctic Circle. Um, I helped to coordinate uh, a European uh, stratospheric ozone uh, uh, program involving lots and lots of countries uh, with EU funding, but also national funding. And we ran that for about more than 10 years. And my colleague, uh, Neil Harris, um, now at Cranfield, and I organized a number of big field campaigns in, in Northern Sweden. So this is a picture taken in Karuna, just inside the Arctic Circle. I think it was in March. The temperature was minus 35 on this day, but it was an absolutely glorious day. And what we're looking at is the preparation for a balloon launch. So this is the big balloon here. There is a balloon um, material is stretched right across here. And this thing here, is the payload. So it's, it's a gondola, which is probably, um, uh, it's the size and weight of a significant motor car. So we're putting big instruments up into the atmosphere and they stay up there for many hours uh, making great measurements. We, we learned a tremendous amount using these measurements, but they are very expensive. And as you can probably imagine, you can't do it very, very often. My colleague in the department, Rod Jones has taken very recently a much, a much different approach to making measurements. And what he's done has been to build lightweight instruments, relatively low cost, reasonable accuracy, uh, but, but instruments that can be used in a network. So you can have a large number of these instruments making, uh, making measurements. So this is a picture of uh, one of these instruments that Rod's built. It's, I think, you know, those are, you can see these typical electronic circuit bits. It's just a, a few um, eight or nine centimeters um, cubed, I guess, something like that. Uh, lightweight, it measures ozone, the oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, another important pollutant. It measures particulates. Um, and crucially, it also measures activity. So it tells you uh, it's a personal monitor somebody would carry this with them. And, and the instrument knows if you're moving quickly, if you're moving slowly, if you're sedentary, um, all that information is available. And the information can be downloaded uh, uh, centrally quite quickly. So what this shows is uh, personal exposure to NOx during uh, a commuting, uh, a number of commutes in, in London. So Rod has deployed these instruments in the UK but also in China and in Bangladesh. So this is London. You can see just about make out central London, I guess there's the river. And the thing that sticks out and the thing that I want you to realize is the huge heterogeneity of NOx from low to high. You can see in some locations, very low amounts of NOx, in other locations, very high amounts of NOx. And sometimes those locations are very close to each other. What governments around the world have tried to do is to say, we don't want ozone or NOx or some other air quality indicator to be above, above a certain value for more than a certain period of time. But you can see how really difficult it is to come up with the right number or alternatively 
the right instrument at the right location, given this huge heterogeneity that we're seeing here. So I think Rod is saying, you know, one of the things we need to do is to rethink our thoughts about, uh, about these, th these levels um, that, that governments are, um, are suggesting. And certainly it's, a, it's, it's clearly a very a complex problem. This is further work of Rod's, same instrument, I think. Um, and now we're looking at Cambridge, it's very small, I'm afraid. Uh, but what this shows are, um, this was, I think, just one person at their typical day uh, and the, because it monitors activity, you can distinguish between being sat at home, uh, being at work, um, walking and cycling, and, and so on. Um, I can see, and probably you can't, but the red dot in the center there is almost certainly a college. Uh, this purpley color or violet color here is Lensfield Road. So the person has been working at Lensfield Road. And you can see these, uh, these yellow and orange dots which is when uh, they were walking or cycling around. So you can monitor activity as well as the concentration of these various gases. Again, if we look over, we're looking over the day at the different gases, and what we see is, for example, there's a huge peak spike in nitric oxide associated with the commute to work, cycling. And it's pretty obvious. You cycle, you're often behind a motor car, that's emitting uh, oxides of nitrogen, and you're, you know, you're going to be breathing in some of that when it's immediately behind you. Um, in contrast, if we look at this, PM is, is particle mass. So this, these are particles that, that are being measured. And there is a peak here, actually, when the, the student was sat at, uh, at home, but actually doing some cooking. So there is a peak associated with cooking in particles. The peak wasn't particularly associated. There's a bit of a peak here associated with the commute, but it's the cooking, the indoor stuff, that's actually causing these large amounts. So again, uh, we have a, a, a problem of trying to say, what, you know, what should, what, how should we regulate um, to say, this is a safe level, this isn't a safe level. Um, the bottom line of, of this work of Rod's is, first of all, that these, uh, the, the peak exposure events due to the local traffic or indeed uh, due to indoor sources will not be captured with conventional monitoring. What's more, the dose, how much you take in um, is not equal to the exposure. The exposure might say, you know, the maximum ozone was a particular value today. The dose is what you take in. We're taking in quite a lot of nitric oxide here, but for the rest of the day, it's actually not very large. Equally, you might expect that the amount that you take in when you're cycling, you might be breathing harder. So you might be taking more in. So there are lots of factors that says this is a complicated problem. And Rod has got all sorts of, 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 of complex uh, numerical techniques that he's using um, to study these data in conjunction with, uh, with medical practitioners. I think he's published papers in the, in the Lancet. We have a new colleague in the chemistry department, uh, Chiara Giorio, who joined the department in March of last year. So I still haven't seen her physically, um, but I'll be able to do that very soon. Uh, but I know her very well, uh, and we've spoken a lot. Chiara is a, um, she's a measurement scientist. Um, she's done a lot of work, will do a lot of work on exploring, um, uh, looking at uh, ice cores to try to say something about paleo atmospheres. But this bit of work here that I thought you might be interested in relates to aerosols and human health. Aerosols, these particles, um, mixtures in the atmosphere, they might contain organics, they might contain metals, all, all sorts of things. Uh, we breathe them in. And this is a, a schematic of a lung. Uh, here, is our, here are aerosol particles with an insoluble and a soluble fraction. Um, she wants to understand how those particles behave in the lung, and secondly, how they cross, cross this alveolar lining into the bloodstream. So she's, she has a research program already working on that. What's more, she started to work with Thomas Knowles, another, another of the great people that we have in our department uh, in, the, in the chemistry of health, uh, to look at how uh, these processes might subsequently have an impact on 
uh, on diseases like Alzheimer's or respiratory diseases. So that's aerosols and health. Completely separate, but related to aerosols, is work that Anya Schmidt and her colleagues are doing on aerosols and climate. Anya is an expert on volcanic emissions. Um, she gets very excited every time uh, there is a volcano uh, in Iceland. Um, she was involved with, um, with the SAGE committee, actually, when the airspace was closed uh, following the um, Icelandic uh, volcanoes um, seven or eight years ago, I guess. And what this picture shows, uh, it relates to the issue of aerosol and climate. Uh, there was an eruption going on at this little island here. This is in the South Sandwich Islands, so it's in the Southern Ocean, not far from um, uh, South Georgia. Uh, so again, not far, too far from the Antarctic. Um, and it was emitting. And this shows the, the emissions as observed from space. And what we're looking at here is the cloud droplet radius. And what we're seeing is that the, the associated with the volcano are quite small particles. But also associated, the clouds associated with that are very white. And whiteness compared to darkness of clouds is crucial in, in, in their, 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 their radiative properties. Uh, and understanding how these, these, um, these clouds are modified by aerosols is a key part of the climate story uh, that people are trying to address. I highlighted that on the second slide that I show you from the IPCC. So uh, Anya's work, amongst other things, is trying to look at these cloud uh, cloud aerosol interactions. I've just got a couple more slides to, to go. One is, uh, again, reverting back to this chemistry climate model that we've developed with the Met Office. And these are some calculations that a student, uh, Zosia uh, Sanyacek, uh, who's in Alex Archibald's group, has been doing uh, with our colleagues from the Met Office. And the nice thing about numerical models is that you can play games with them. So what she's done in this first red calculation is to take uh, as some assumptions that the IPCC has made about how methane emissions could change on, under certain conditions. And it's actually quite a severe um, climate change scenario that she's looked at, but with methane going up uh, like this. And then what she also did was a run, uh, I should say that about half of the emissions of methane into the atmosphere are natural, and about half of them are man-made. What she did in this calculation was to instantaneously switch off at this point all the man-made emissions. So it's a, obviously it's a, it's a hypothetical, um, idealized calculation that she's doing. But what it shows is that if you were able to do that, methane levels drop quite, quite quickly. The time scale for this methane to change is on the order of a decade. And that makes it a really attractive target for, for control, for climate control. The point is made over here. This is, these are the temperatures calculated in these two runs. Here we have the temperature when methane is increasing strongly and, and temperature going up during the first half of this century very significantly, more than two degrees in, in this calculation. If, on the other hand, the methane were to be controlled, um, you know, well, we were to get rid of all the, uh, uh, the man-made emissions, then the temperature rise is significantly less. There are still some underlying greenhouse gas changes which are driving the temperature up. But the point is that there is a big difference between allowing methane to run away in an uncontrolled way and controlling methane. And that, that difference in this calculation is more than a degree. So it's a huge component of, um, of what we're trying to do in terms of delivering on the, the Paris targets. If you did something like this, you've got a chance. If you do something like this, you don't have a chance at all. Here, uh, this is some data uh, that we gathered in one of these Arctic campaigns in the, um, uh, in the late, um, late 20th century. Um, and what I was showing you, what I was intending to show you, was ozone at 20 kilometers at Spitsbergen, basically right throughout that winter. And what we saw in that winter was, was quite severe ozone loss in, in, the, uh, in the Arctic, uh, very significant ozone loss on the order of 
60 or 70 percent at 20 kilometers. And the point that I was trying to make, that I wanted to make with this, not so much about the ozone loss, was the fact that we do understand how ozone is destroyed. Um, so we understand the chemistry. And that, that understanding feeds into the Montreal Protocol. The Montreal Protocol, but this is 1980, uh, this is 2000, and this is the end of this century. This is what was happening before the Montreal Protocol. These gases, the concentration of, of these, these halogens were, were, were rising, and, and this is just an extrapolation. What the Montreal Protocol did was to say, let's take our foot off the gas, but only very slightly. So the initial Montreal Protocol had us following this trajectory, which would also have been disastrous. But because of, of our understanding of science and our improved understanding of science, we were able to go to the protocol and say, the, the, you know, our understanding has advanced. So this, is, this was actually Mrs. Thatcher's meeting in London uh, that she was at, um, which you know, made a, a, a big difference in the first half of this, this century. Replacement gases in the second half would have been bad. And we're now following through further um, enhancements and, and uh, modifications to the protocol. We're now following this kind of trajectory. So that we are losing uh, slowly uh, these, these gases, these ozone destroying gases. And our modern calculations into the future, uh, are shown by this lucky color, uh, the red are observations, and out into the future, we're seeing a trajectory of recovery. So my near enough final slide is, is just some observations on why did the Montreal Protocol work so well? It worked well because, first of all, every single country in the world has ratified it. Every single country has signed up to it. And what's more, those countries agree to report uh, their use of these ozone de destroying gases. Um, most of them are phased out now. Some of them are in transition. Uh, but but you know, they would have to report what they were doing. And they would have to ask if they wanted a critical use exemption. For example, early on, uh, some CFC use in uh, aerosol um, inhalers was allowed. It's a slow process. The decisions are reached by consensus. They're not majority decisions. Every single party has to agree. So we end up being in meetings. You know, this, I think this was in Doha. You know, this room would be full uh, during the plenaries. Uh, people arguing. It's a slow process. It takes a long time to get everybody on board. But it works slowly. You could argue it'd be great if it was faster, but ultimately everybody signs up. There is financial assistance. Um, the non-Article 5, that's essentially what we'd call, you know, in shorthand, the developed countries assist the developing countries. And more than $30 billion has been used in assisting um, transitions. Where I come in is that um, the, the protocol calls every, every four years for independent assessments, both of the science, which is what I'm involved in, but also of the technology and economics and of the environmental impact. And what we do is we provide policy relevant information. It is not the role of the scientists to tell um, the, the, the governments of, of the world what to do. But what we do do is we say, if you do this, then the consequence is that. If on the other hand, you did something else, then the consequence would be, would be this. And that might be better than that, but it's up to you, uh, the governments of the world, to decide how you translate that into policy. And as I've already said, as the science advances, we can periodically update through these independent assessments or more urgently if required to tell the parties, um, you know, here is, here is something that, that ought to be brought to your, your attention. And I think it is, I think it has worked very well. Um, Kofi Annan has called, uh, called the uh, Montreal Protocol the single most successful international agreement to date. And, and I think there is no doubt that that's true. Indeed, the climate benefits of getting rid of these ozone depleting gases, as I've said, that they're also greenhouse gases, is actually greater than, 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 the, uh, than any other of, of the uh, efforts that came out of, uh, of Kyoto in the first, 
decade and a half of, of the Kyoto Protocol. So this is a really successful international effort. I'm going to stop now. I thank you for listening. I hope I haven't um, been too fast or, or given you too much detail. I did want to thank my colleagues, Anya Schmidt and, and Chiara Giorgio, uh, Rod Jones and Alex Archibald for, for their help in putting some of this material together. And of course, I want to thank my group again for all, uh, for all their assistance.